Welcome to this week's Site for White Talking News for Friday the 26th of February 2021. This is Chris reading an article from the Island Echo. Ireland's pensioners urged to check if they are eligible for extra help. Pensioners across the Isle of Wight are being urged to check if they are eligible for pension credit, as figures show many could be missing out on a vital financial boost. More than 160,000 pensioners in the South East currently receive pension credit. However, some pensioners across the region are still not claiming this extra financial help, which is why the government is renewing calls for all pensioners to check if they could be eligible. The Minister for Pensions, Guy Opperman, has said, We want to make sure that all older people receive the support they are entitled to. Pension credit can be claimed by phone and online, ensuring that older people can apply safely wherever they are. The online pension credit calculator is also on hand to help pensioners check if they're likely to be eligible and get an estimate of what they may receive. I also want to encourage everyone with retired family, friends and loved ones to check in with them to see if they could be eligible for extra financial assistance through pension credit. Having savings, a pension or owning a home are not necessarily barriers to receiving pension credit and even a small award of pension credit can provide access to a wide range of other benefits such as help with housing costs, council tax or heating bills. For those over 75 and in receipt of pension credit, these additional benefits include continued entitlement to a free TV licence. More than 1.5 million older people across Great Britain receive extra financial help through pension credit. For more information, to use the free online calculator, to check eligibility or to claim, visit gov.uk forward slash pension dash credit or call 0800 Nine nine one two three four. This is Brian reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press. Sandown residents object to homeless hostel plan. Residents are objecting to another application for a house of multiple occupancy HMO, this time in Sandown. Among objections to the application to change the use of the Hondra on Leed Street, Sandown, residents say they are already blighted by the HMOs in the area, sick of the trouble they cause and would not feel safe having the tenants on their doorstep. Plans have been submitted to the Isle of Wight Council to change the current guest house into an eight bed HMO. The application is by Two Saints, a homeless not-for-profit service in partnership with the council to be used as part of the homeless pathway to reduce rough sleeping and prevent homelessness. In planning documents, Two Saints say the accommodation would be used as move on property with tenants usually staying between 3 and 12 months. Individuals who use the HMO will not be placed directly from the street, but will have gone through an initial process to determine they are ready to live independently and successfully and not negatively impact the local community. One mother, however, 
objecting to the application is concerned having the HMO on the street will make a scary and intimidating atmosphere for her son as antisocial behaviour comes hand in hand with this type of accommodation. She also said she was worried about crime levels increasing. Another objector said there was a need for hotel and guest accommodation in the tourist destination, with another worried having the HMO next door to a hotel would put off tourists. Hampshire's Constabulary's Crime and Disorder Officer said the police force broadly support the HMO, but that was conditional on the tenants being at, at the appropriate stage of recovery to reside there. They do have concerns about the possible problems caused by the residents. Any type of antisocial behaviour or nuisance in or outside of the property will not be tolerated, two saints have said, with a member of staff present six days a week and CCTV installed. They said, we believe the property to be a really good opportunity to change lives and enable people to take new steps on their individual journeys. To view or comment on the application, you can visit the Council's planning portal. Comments will be accepted until March the 12th. Pen your wallets as 4.99% council tax rise confirmed. From Island Echo, Iona. Full council with three alternative budgets shot down. The decision means that island households will now have to fork out 4.99% more in council tax from April, on top of the precipitate rises such as a 7.4% police precipitate rise. The budget proposals put forward by County Hall's Conservative administration have this evening, Wednesday, been approved by full council with three alternative budgets shot down. The decision means that island households will now have to fork out 4.99% more in council tax from April, on top of the precipit rises such as a 7.4% police precipit rise. As well as a rise in council tax, motorists will have to pay 100% more for overnight parking from October, increasing from £1 to £2, and bereaved families face a 7% increase in cremation fees. Dinosaur Isle will run a reduced opening hours and the Lord Lewis Library in Newport will be closed for an extra day a week. The mobile library service will also be scrapped. Conservatives say the focus of the budget is to ensure a financially sustainable position for the local authority, underpinned by three important priorities. Enduring that the council is able to continue keeping the island's community safe, to create an environment and financial plan to deliver the economic recovery the island needs and to continue towards achieving the council's vision of the island being an inspirational place in which which to grow up, live, work and visit. However, many will likely argue that forcing islanders to pay yet more money at a time when they simply don't have the spare cash is not helping the island become a place to work or live. The Liberal Democrats have declared the budget cruel and many have commented on social media saying that this latest move may just cost the Conservatives their seats in May's local elections. Councillor Dave Stewart, Isle of Wight Council leader, has said This is the fifth budget that this Conservative administration has delivered since that time just over four years ago when the then leadership of the independent administration walked out on the island without warning, claiming that they could not set a lawful and balanced budget. With no strategy in place and reserves depleted, we immediately had to pull a budget plan together and take steps to get the local authorities' finances back to a healthy position. That has now been achieved and the budget approved this evening confirms the responsible approach we've taken. In contrast, we've seen alternative budget proposals with headline-grabbing ideas such as restoring dotto trains rather instead on focusing on how to keep the community safe. Other proposals have suggested raiding reserves, which would leave them at a dangerously low level. The council tax rise of a 4.99%, which Liberal Democrat and Independent Alternatives also supported, generates additional income of just £4.4 million. Whilst it is not sufficient to cover all additional costs on its own, it is necessary in order that we meet our social care responsibilities, and 3% of the increase relates specifically to those. 
This budget ensures that the books are balanced with a sustainable financial plan that deals with the challenges we face now and provides a medium-term financial strategy to meet the requirements of tomorrow. This secure the Council's long-term financial future. This budget also provides much-needed assistance for our community, including a COVID support fund of over £14 million to protect people against the worst impacts of COVID and to help address important priorities such as long COVID, mental well-being and ongoing business support. The budget also means we're able to continue important investment in our transformation programmes, which is making a real difference. By 2024, the Council will have no outstanding budget deficit to cover. This means that we will be well placed in to further support a growing economy whilst at the same time continuing to keep our community safe. This in contrast to the unmet 7.5 million savings target that we inherited from the independents in February 2017 when they walked out. This budget also secures general reserves at over £8 million. These are essential when we're faced with responding effectively to something as huge as a pandemic, which we have been able to do. This is the prudent management of the Council's budget in action. Such sound management is needed for a sustainable financial future. Tonight's approval of the budget includes plans to spend £550,000 on air conditioning and data centre upgrades, £300,000 on two sets of average speed cameras, and £30,000 on boys for Sandown Bay, things that islanders have said could simply wait. The budget will also see us invest £9.6 million from our capital resources to help leverage in a further £46.5 million of external funding. This will result in £56 million of capital being invested in the island's future. This figure includes over £40 million invested in coastal protection, £6.4 million invested in our schools, £2.9 million invested in affordable housing and a new biosphere centre, and a further £1.3 million in highway improvements, including investment in sustainable transport. Hello, this is Steve reading a story from the Isle of Wight County Press, headlined Lockdown. Drink driver drove to the Isle of Wight from Welwyn Garden City. A recovering alcoholic who drove uninsured from Hertfordshire to the Isle of Wight during lockdown to see his sick father was caught drink driving while more than four times the limit. A passenger on board Red Funnel Southampton to East Cow's car ferry spotted Jason Malcolm White get into his car as it reached the island and called the police, believing he had been drinking, said Liz Miller, prosecuting at the Isle of Wight Magistrates Court. Police followed White of Welwyn Garden City, eventually stopping him along Bridlesford Road near Robin Hill on February 1st. White, who's 39, blew an alcohol reading of 120 micrograms on the roadside, but his second reading at Newport Police Station was 147. The legal limit is 35. The bench was told White's record included three previous drink driving offences, his most recent being in 2016, and another of being drunk in charge of a vehicle. White, who admitted drink driving and driving while uninsured, claimed he drove to the island after he had received a tearful call from his mother, who said she needed support after learning his father had cancer, explained Oscar Vincent in mitigation. White who's an unemployed warehouse worker, relapsed into alcoholism the day before he travelled to the island, the court was told. The bench handed White an interim disqualification and bailed him for sentencing at St Albans Magistrates Court on April 20th. This is Petrina reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. £292,000 confirmed for domestic abuse victims on the Isle of Wight. £292,000 to support victims of domestic abuse has been confirmed by the local authority. As first reported by Isle of Wight Radio earlier this month, February, the Government Minister for Rough Sleeping and Housing Eddie Hughes allocated the money for the Isle of Wight Council to provide support for domestic abuse victims and their children. The council said the extra funding allocated as part of the government's 2020 domestic abuse bill would help ensure the right level of support was being provided to those who need it. 
Safe accommodation is an essential function with a package of support available. Councillor Claire Mosdell, Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care, Public Health and Housing Needs, said, Tackling domestic abuse is an important issue for the island and a priority for the Council and our partners. We recognise the significant impact it has not only on victims but their wider families too. Providing an island specific provision for victims and their families is important and we know that the right service is essential to enabling families to be able to access safe support if the situation arises with a safe place to go if needed. Councillor Gary Peace, Cabinet Member for Community Safety, said As a Metropolitan Police Officer, I worked for four years in a community safety unit investigating domestic violence and other hate crime. I have first-hand experience of the trauma and damage caused to the lives of victims, families and friends. This experience lives with me to this day. The workload was one of the highest of any investigative departments and domestic abuse is also one of the most high-risk and fraught crimes and experiences that victims can suffer. The money secured through the hard work of officers is vital in supporting the approach we currently take and mean we will be able to constantly improve our responses to this heinous crime. It will go to a huge way to supporting all of our combined efforts to protect victims and their families. The funding will support the continuation of commissioned services currently delivered by the Council Support Provider, You First. It will also help fund a new duty on councils to ensure victims and their children are able to access life-saving support in safe accommodation, a key part of the 2020 Domestic Abuse Bill. The duty will come into effect later this year, subject to the bill becoming law. In anticipation of these additional responsibilities, the Council is undertaking a review of its response to domestic abuse and assessing the needs of victims as part of the Ministry of Housing Communities and Local Government guidance. Theresa Brimble Brennan, the Council's Domestic Abuse Project Officer, said the island was in a good position to undertake these duties with a well-established Domestic Abuse Forum, DAF, providing leadership in this area of work. She said, The Council and the DAF will be central to ensuring the island sets out a robust strategy for tackling domestic abuse based on an assessment of the needs of the victims. If you are suffering because of domestic abuse or know someone who is, call the island support provider you first via their free phone helpline 0800 234 6266 or email you first isle of white at the utrust.org.uk this is michael reading an article from the isle of white radio Isle of Wight vaccine rollout, all people with learning disabilities prioritised. All Islanders on the Learning Disability Register are to be invited for a coronavirus vaccine, the Health Secretary has confirmed. The Joint Committee on Vaccination, JCVI, has advised the Government of the changes to the priority list. It means 150,000 more people with learning disabilities will now fall into Category 6. Previously, only people with severe or profound learning disabilities were eligible, as Isle of Wight Radio reported. It follows a campaign 
by the Isle of Wight man who has been calling for everyone with learning disabilities to be prioritised for the jab. Following Isle of Wight Radio's story, Sam Jeffries has now had his first dose of Covid vaccine. Health Secretary Matt Hancock has confirmed that he has asked the NHS to make changes to the priority list. Figures from Public Health England show disabled people are up to six times more likely to die from COVID-19. For those aged between 18 and 34 with learning disabilities, the mortality rate is 30 times higher. This is Chris reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press. Isle of Wight woman filmed court trial and put it on Facebook. An Isle of Wight woman who videoed and live streamed her partner's Crown Court trial on social media was handed a four month jail term, suspended for two years. Emma Hamilton Toogood, who used a mobile phone to record the trial of her partner at the Isle of Wight Crown Court in August 2019, was found to be in contempt of court. Despite signs outside the courtroom stating it was forbidden to use a mobile phone or any other recording device, Hamilton Toogood streamed more than an hour's footage of the two-day trial via her Facebook account. One recording lasted 45 minutes, with others lasting 26 and 9 minutes. An in-person hearing at the Divisional Court of the Royal Courts of Justice was told last week. When the police discovered this the day after the trial, Hamilton Toogood's partner had already been convicted on all counts and was remanded in custody awaiting his sentence. At a High Court hearing last October, it was told Hamilton Toogood, 23, immediately apologised for her actions and that she did it for evidence, unaware she had been in the wrong. She made repeated video recordings of the Crown Court proceedings at some of the most sensitive moments of the trial, as well as the empanelment of the jury, her partner's evidence from the stand and the delivery of the verdicts, the Solicitor General said. The recordings were available to view live on Facebook and therefore available for download. They were downloaded hundreds of times. The situation had been aggravated by the fact the defendant and persons in the public gallery, from where Hamilton Toogood had been recording, had tried to disrupt proceedings. The judgment added that someone had warned Hamilton Toogood via Facebook about recording legal proceedings a week before her partner's trial. Hamilton Toogood failed to appear at last week's hearing and was not legally represented. A friend of Hamilton Toogood offered evidence by email that she had learning difficulties and would not be able to comprehend legal proceedings against her. The Solicitor General said she had, in her favour, shown remorse by immediately confessing to her actions on her arrest for which she spent a night in custody. Alongside the suspended jail term, the court ordered her to pay £500 costs. This is Brian reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press. Challenging Sandown shot fire on historic Isle of Wight Pier. Fire crews from Sandown, Shanklin, Ryde and Ventnor were called to Sandown Pier in the early hours of Tuesday morning. They responded after smoke was spotted coming from the ground floor of one of the buildings on the pier just after 4am. 
firefighters wearing breathing apparatus and carrying hose reels and a jet were used to fight the fire. Bembridge Coast Guard Rescue Team were also called out, taking photos of the incident and pro providing support. They said on Twitter, excellent work from the fire service. Early intervention from them prevented fire spread. Crews were on the scene until just after 6 a.m. Deputy Chief Fire Officer Steve Apter tweeted, Good stop by firefighters this morning at Sandown Pier. An historic building and the type that are challenging to deal with. Well done team, thanks. Work on the historic landmark began in 1876. Measuring 360 feet, it opened in 1879 and in 1895 was extended to 875 feet. It is home to a number of shops and attractions which are currently closed due to COVID-19. Delighted. Isle of Wight Beach makes it into UK's top 20 from Isle of Wight Radio. Iona. Despite not being able to visit the Isle of Wight's beaches, they still remain at the forefront of people's minds. Shanklin Beach has now been voted as one of the UK's top 20. It's part of a survey by WWF UK and Sky Ocean Rescue. It follows the announcement the Isle of Wight was named as the UK's number one holiday destination in a poll by Big Seven Travel. Shanklin Beach on the east coast of the Isle of Wight has often proved popular with local residents and with visitors. Sally Beston, chairman of Shanklin Hotel and Accommodation Association, said, I'm delighted to read that Shanklin Beach has been voted in the top 20 of the UK's best beaches. Shanklin really is a beautiful place to live and visit. My members will be delighted to welcome visitors when the time is right. When it comes to stunning vistas, picturesque prep freshwater reached the top 30 of the UK's most beautiful views, according to a separate poll by a railway company. Historically, Freshwater Bay has always been a favourite and was home to Victorian photographer Julie Margaret Cameron at Dimbola and Poet Laureate of the time Alfred Lord Tennyson at Farringford House. Hello, this is Steve reading a story from the Isle of Wight County Press, headlined New Toilets for Newport as Five-Year Plan Comes to Fruition. Newport and Carisbrook Community Council, the NCCC, has opened new public toilets in Newport's post office lane at the culmination of a five-year plan. In 2016, NCCC took over all public toilets in Newport and Carisbrook when the Isle of Wight Council ceased to run them. Post office lane was quickly identified as being the toilets in most need of upgrading, given the general condition and having the highest footfall of all the locations. Rather than refurbish, a new building was deemed to be more appropriate to provide clean and modern facilities. Users will pay 40 pence, which can be by coins or contactless payment. The scheme cost £190,000, of which £160,000 is financed by a public works loan over 10 years. The lifespan of the toilets is estimated at 40 to 50 years as the modular design means individual components can be replaced when needed. The renovation includes new landscaping, planting and a green roof planted with sedum to create an area to encourage wildlife. Councillor Julie Jones-Evans, chair of the NCCC and member for Newport Central, said, When we took over the public toilets in Newport and Carisbrook, it was immediately clear the condition of the post office lane facilities meant they would need replacing. It's taken a while and significant investment, but the result is such a marked change. Instead of being an embarrassment, these new toilets are something to be proud of and more in keeping with our status as the county town. Hello, this is Lisa, CEO of Site for White, welcoming you to this week's Talking News. We've been busy this week finalising the newsletter which has now gone to print. In the newsletter there's a few interesting articles I thought I would tell you about in advance of you receiving the newsletter next week. 
The National Office of Statistics does a census every 10 years. This is an extremely important census as it allows charities like ourselves to gain real data on who is living in our local area and, for example, with what level of sight loss. It allows us to apply for funding and it also allows us to really understand our own demographic and therefore alter our services in line with our demographic needs. However, we understand that some people may not be able to fill the census in as this year it has gone digital and it is online. We here at Sight for White are ready and able to help. If you receive the census, as a visually impaired person, you should automatically be sent a paper copy. If you aren't, you can phone up and get one. Or if you feel you still cannot complete the survey, no problem. Give Sight for White a call on 52205 and we will fill the census in for you. We have ensured that all GDPR regulations have been followed and we are on hand to help you complete the survey on a timely basis. Also included in the newsletter this month is a very important feature on the Sight for White Chicks. Our volunteers are busily knitting little chicks who are laying Cadbury's cream eggs. These chicks can be purchased for £2 per chick, including the chick and the cream egg. And of course, you can always use the chick next year to put your new cream egg in. We're also producing little baskets with families of eggs in and a special message to your loved ones. Please don't hesitate to give us a call on 52205 to purchase your eggs. They can be collected from Millbook on a contactless basis or we can post them out to you. Finally, also detailed in the newsletter is our Pamper Hamper. Debbie at Dress for Less has kept the volunteers busy and has managed to have gifts donated so that we can pull together a Mother's Day Pamper Hamper. This includes Lanson Champagne with Lind chocolates, DVDs of chick flicks with popcorn, and head to toe pamper items, including creams, facials, and lovely cozy socks for your feet. To enter the prize draw, it is five pounds per ticket. Again, you can just call the office and we can sort out the ticket for you. Finally, I'd like to introduce the next article, which is Ruth Hollingshead, one of our trustees. Ruth appeared on both Isle of Wight Radio and the Isle of Wight County Press this week. Ruth has put herself forward as someone who can help with those who are suffering from Charles Bonnet syndrome. Charles Bonnet syndrome has come to light recently as one of the main characters in the soap opera Coronation Street has developed Charles Bonnet syndrome. This is where you see things that look extremely real, but they're not there. It can be likened to tinnitus. Tinnitus is where your brain produces a ringing noise in your ears because you can no longer hear high frequencies, so your brain replicates them. With Charles Bonnet syndrome, your brain is replicating what it thinks should be there. So, for example, if you have a chair where the cat would normally sit, you can see the cat sitting in the chair even when the cat isn't there because your brain is replicating what it expects to see. This said, Charles Bonnet syndrome can also produce extremely frightening hallucinations. So please do listen to Ruth's interview next, where she offers some very sensible advice and talks about where you can gain immediate help. Thank you very much for listening to this week's Talking News, Lisa. My name is Ruth Hollingshead. Um, I live in Carisbrook on the Isle of Wight, and I, I'm a trustee for Sight for White, the island sight loss charity, and also volunteer there as well. I have been for about 20 years. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So first of all, can we start by talking about Charles Bonnet syndrome? And can you just explain to any islanders who don't know what that is, what that is? Okay, Charles Bonnet syndrome. In a sort of very, very layman's term nutshell, it's a bit like sort of phantom limb pain that amputees experience. Your brain tries to make sense of what's missing. So if you experience sort of sudden sight loss, or a rapid change in your vision, that's when it usually happens, and your brain is basically trying to put in images that will make sense. So it'll fill in the missing gaps with familiar things, um, yeah, to try and try and sort of bridge gaps in, within your sort of visual field. So yeah, in layman's terms, that's basically what it is. I'm sure it's far more complicated, but yes. Okay, and um, so the symptoms of this is obviously sort of hallucinations and things like that. There is no cure for this, is that right? I mean, I am no medical expert. As far as I know, there is no hard and fast cure for it. There have been trials with medication. There have been trials with sort of hypnotherapy and things like that. 
Um, for most patients, when their vision sort of stabilises, these they sort of peter out not for everybody i mean i've had them for about 35 years now um and i get them probably on a weekly basis but for the majority of people they do they do sort of cease as your vision gets more stable and how do you live with it ruth because you say you get them sorry did you say once a week at least once i mean i've one this morning okay it's tiny things i mean for example i've got a very very bright well-lit kitchen with sort of very very white work surfaces i was making a cup of, co- cup of coffee looking forward i have no central vision i just have a sparkly big patch in the middle with constant sort of flashing lights and i've got very murky foggy vision in a sort of polo shape around the outside of my peripheral so i can see a little tiny bit at the very bottom if you like of my vision i was staring straight ahead making a cup of coffee and i thought i saw a spider run across the work surface now, in reality, it's actually, I could just catch my eyelashes out the corner of my eye, if you like, but my brain changes it into something else. I mean, fortunately, I know it's not, well, I hope it wasn't a spider. No, I know it's not a spider there. Um, so I can just think, oh, pfft. but if I wasn't expecting that or I didn't know what it was, particularly if I had a phobia of spiders, that would have been quite upsetting. I mean, for me, the majority of mine are usually um, things like, I will see steps where there aren't steps. I will see lampposts. And it's caused by shadows on the pavement will turn into something. Um, for example, a bin may turn into a person. That's, it's very, very brief and it's very quick. But, I mean, I know my local area, so I know what is real and what isn't real. But if I'm on holiday, for example, or somewhere I don't know, it's a lot more disorientating for me. It sounds... I put all my faith, all my faith in my guide dog and just <laughs> keep going. Oh, honestly, Ruth, that's brilliant. I mean, it does sound very scary if you didn't know what it was. I mean, you saying you've had it for 30 years. When did it start for you and how did it start? Um, I probably didn't realise what it was. The first time I really thought about it, um, I saw a hooded figure peering over my child's cot. Um, And it's actually the curtains because I'd gone in, I just got up struggled in there, very poor lighting, looked over and saw this hooded figure sort of leaning over the cot. Thought, ah! um, but yeah, sort of deep breath and turn the light on and think, it's actually the curtains. And I'm thinking, that, and then it sort of started to make sense a little bit. My, my brain is changing things into things that aren't there. And I did a bit of more research and sort of realised, you know, found out a bit more about child bonding. I spoke to my eye specialist who fortunately, you know, was quite up on it and knew what I was talking about. And we discussed it. And I, it made a lot more sense of sort of things that had happened when I was younger, things that I thought I'd seen. And because my mum had said she'd seen me sometimes, I'd suddenly stop dead or I'd, I'd step to one side to avoid something that wasn't there. And it's because I'd seen something. I see a lot of little dogs running around. It's usually a paper bag or leaves this time of year. But they turn into little dogs or things. But as a volunteer at Sight for Whites, I mean, I over the last 20 years, I've come across people who it's had a really traumatic effect, you know, on their lives because they haven't understood what is happening. It's probably the first time they've spoken to anybody about it. Because particularly with eye conditions related to older age, so macular degeneration, sometimes strokes, glaucoma, um, it does happen later on in life. And people are frightened that it's actually a cognitive impairment, that maybe it's the early stages of dementia. So they keep quiet. They don't want to say anything. They don't want to, you know, who wants to say, I'm seeing things that aren't there. So that people do keep quiet. Um, really pleased it's been brought, you know, brought to the public eye now. People to be a bit more open and be able to discuss it. What's really interesting, Ruth, what you say, I mean, that's absolutely, I was going to ask you, what was your first thought when you first had the experience? And you've obviously explained about your child's court. I mean, that was terrifying. That must be absolutely terrifying. And I'm really glad you said that about, you know, other people's experiences and about dementia and stuff, because I read up on that. And there was, uh, yeah, people often get them confused. And, you know, like you say, probably aren't speaking about it and are worried at something else. I mean, it's really, really interesting. And it sounds pretty scary, actually, to be honest. I mean, I think the thing is, particularly for a lot of people, because your brain fills in something familiar, um, for some people, suddenly their dead spouses sat on the sofa where they've always sat. You know, so obviously that's really upsetting, suddenly, because your brain's filling filling in the familiar. Um, And and some people see really great... I mean, I never see really grotesque things, but sort of gargoyles and goblins and horrible little faces are quite common. Um, I've I've, I've worked with people in the past who've... um, for example, woke up thinking their room is on fire. 
Um, I've, I've worked in the past with people who, uh, I've worked with a lady who was sectioned. We're going back a lot of years now. I've worked with somebody who had electric shock therapy several years ago, you know, decades ago, because it just wasn't understood. Um, and they couldn't explain the sort of physical physical symptoms. So I'm so, I say I'm so pleased. I mean, I don't... I don't watch Coronation Street, but it's soap operas have their place in bringing these sorts of things really to the public eye. And so people can discuss it and hopefully make a bit more sense of things. Yeah, absolutely. And Ruth, if you mind me asking, how did you lose your sight? Um, I have a genetic condition. It's called Rodcone dystrophy. So my sight started to deteriorate and I was probably about eight or nine. Um, and it, it was a slow deterioration over my teenage years. Um, it started off with a central vision going. It's now impacting my peripheral vision. I've got about between 3 and 5% functional vision, but I was registered as, it's now SSI, as blind in 1998. But, and even now I can make out blurry objects, which probably is where, it, where why I experience um, Charles Bonnet syndrome um, more so is because I have very because of the flashing lights and the flickering lights in, the vi- in my vision it's never constant um, so therefore I haven't got that stability that, that usually brings an end to, to the condition and I say not always some people will have it forever um, it, but it is quite uncommon it usually sort of does stabilise and stop mm, That's really interesting so um, Ruth what is your message to Islanders then? My message to Islanders would be if you are experiencing, if you if experiencing um, hallucinations, or you know you have suspicions that you're seeing things that aren't there, talk to somebody, talk to your GP, give Sight for White a call. Um, we can um, signpost you on. There's a fantastic organisation called Esme's Umbrella, run by a lady called Judith Potts, and she's worked very closely with the team at Granada, um, talking about Charles Bonnet syndrome and. Yeah, so call Sight for White and we can direct you on to other services. We'll be able to help you, but definitely, definitely talk about it. Um, yeah. Brilliant, Ruth. And is there anything else that you would like to mention? I was just like, I was just going to say, um, very often people live, live with their sight loss quite happily in their own home. It's a change in their circumstances. So, for example, if some, suddenly somebody moves to um, sheltered accommodation or they move house, you know, go into care home or assisted living, their familiar surroundings are gone and that can be another trigger for making their brain is trying to make sense of their surroundings because up until now it's just been filling in what it knows is there and suddenly it can't do that anymore. So that could be another trigger um, for people um, who have maybe have elderly relatives who are moving into sheltered accommodation or a care home. They suddenly may have these hallucinations where they've never had them before. So it's, it's all these different things just to watch out for. Scaffolding News, week commencing the 1st of March 2021. Shankton area, Rio's Burgers, 9 Regent Street, 5 to 7 Langard Road, 48 Regent Street. Ventnor area, the Co-op Pier Street. Ride area, 51 George Street, Passageway, St Mary's Passage, Newport area, 25 and 27 Lugley Street, The Halifax, High Street, Sandown area, Corkheads Restaurant, Avenue Road, Flat C, St George's Hall, Cows area, Prince's Building, 9 Bath Road, 106 Park Road, Yarmouth area, Grove Cottage, St James's Street. Skips, Ride area, outside of Woodlands, Ride Road, Sea View. Newport area, opposite 61 Elm Grove. Shanklin area, 25 Donington Drive. Ventnor area, 15 Steep Hill Court. Malmesbury Cottage, Manor Road, Roxall. Cowes area, 
31 Tennyson Road, East Cows area, 63 Grange Road, Sandown area, Esplanade, Sandown Esplanade, Bembridge area, 44 Forelands Road, The Farm Shop, 8 High Street. Site for White would like to thank you for listening to this week's edition of the Talking News. We would also like to thank our volunteers for reading and a particular thank you to the Isle of Wight County Press, On the White, Island Echo, Isle of Wight Radio and a special thank you to Vectis Radio.